Well, good morning. I have to tell you, I am, I am happy to be back. I was, as many of you know, I was not here last Sunday. This time last week, I was in Huntington, West Virginia, and, and I, was, uh, I was helping Lily move out of her dorm room. And, and, you know, Lily takes after her mother in that she's an excellent student, and she takes after me in that she finds herself collecting a lot of things. <laughs> and, and it's okay because she's an artist. She transforms them into beautiful things. And me, I'm too busy. It all just stays junk. But, but here's the thing. We're, we're loading up this van. It was an amazing, an amazing couple of days. I, uh, I, there, there is a time in, in the near future where I will be taking a vacation that doesn't involve over 30 hours behind a steering wheel. And I'm I'm excited about that. I, I drove up to, to West Virginia, and the first part was great. Drove up with Amy, and, and we got up there on, on, on Thursday. We got up there just in time for a, a, a graduation ceremony for, for Lily. Uh, it was the Jaeger, it was the Jaeger medallion ceremony. And, and we're there, and they, she got these giant medals. Uh, and, and here's a picture of her. And these, they're, they're, they're people on her, her left and her right. And this is, this is, uh, this is Joel and Rachel. And, and Joel and Rachel are married to one another and they are both English professors. And, and Lily, in her cell phone, has, by their names, mom, question mark, dad, question mark. And for, for Amy and I, she has moth, moth, M-O-T-H, and dude. And, and it's a long story. It's an illustration for another sermon. But, but here really is with her, with her two parents who live in Huntington, West Virginia. These are people who did not raise her, who did not give birth to her, and yet she calls them mom. And dad. And why is that? It's because these were people who took her under their wings while she was far away from home. People who gave her nurturing and grace filled love. And as a parent, I'm not threatened by this at all. It fills me with joy to know that God provides people for my children who can supplement the nurturing love that Amy and I give them. Family is so much bigger than we think. And so it's Mothering Sunday. This is a day where we celebrate not just the ones who gave birth to us, and raised us, but the ones who have given us grace-filled, nurturing love, the people God has put in our paths to help us along, to make us feel safe, to help us know that we are loved. So Lily and I started talking on the 16-hour trip back and, and one thing that she, she mentioned was, was an article that, that she had read. You know, we were talking about Joel and Rachel, how they were her parents as well somehow. And she, she mentioned this article that she had read, and it was about the importance of found families for LGBTQ youth, especially in a crisis. And this article talks about how so many kids and so many young people in the LGBTQ community, they have been rejected by their parents because they didn't live up to the image that their parents had of them. And the, the article points out that 40% of LGBTQ youth who are homeless, excuse me, 40% of homeless teenagers are LGBTQ ones. And so many people have this feeling of being rejected by their parents. 
But there's this phenomenon called found families. And it's this recognition that God puts people in our path when we need family. When we need someone to nurture us and to protect us and to be there for us. That there can be people like that and it can fill the role of family. In our, in our text today, it's from the, the Gospel of John. And, and a large number of contemporary scholars hold the hypothesis that the, the Gospel of John in its final form was put together by a, a community of Christians in, in Ephesus. And this community of Christians, many of them were, were converts to Christianity from Judaism. And, and what happened is they, when they became followers of Jesus, they were rejected by the synagogue. They were rejected by all of their friends and by all of their family. And so the text today is from Jesus' farewell discourse. It's the passage that we read on Maundy Thursday, which is sort of an odd choice for six weeks after Easter. But what we need to remember in, in, in the lectionary and, and in the, the liturgical year, next week is Ascension Sunday. It is the Sunday where we recognize that Jesus was raised to the right hand of God the Father. So we're going through this farewell address of Jesus before we recognize that Jesus has ascended. But Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, he says to them, he says, in effect, I have chosen you to be my family. You are my chosen family. You are my found family. He says this, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. The parental nurturing love that I have received from my Father, I have loved you with the same love. So abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. It's interesting when we look at the ministry and the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus throughout his life is saying family is bigger than you think. There's an occasion where Jesus is, is, is in a house and he's teaching and and. People come to him and they say, Jesus, your mother and brothers are here. And, and, and he's sitting in this crowd of people. And, and Jesus replies, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those around him, he said, here are my mothers, my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Family is bigger than we think. So what is Jesus talking about when he says, those who do the will of my Father, the will of God, those who follow my commandments? Well, John continues, the Gospel of John continues, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So what Jesus is describing here is this blessed cycle. I made a diagram. We, Jesus says, abide in my love. And by living in Jesus' love, by dwelling in Jesus' love, by meditating on what Jesus has done for us, we are empowered to love one another. And as we love one another, as we lay our lives down for those who we love, 
as we think about other people than just ourselves, we are empowered to abide in the love of Jesus. And the cycle continues. It is a cycle of life and it is a cycle of fullness, of joy. Receiving love and giving love. It doesn't get divided, it gets multiplied. And our joy is full. But there's more to this love that makes it even more exciting. It's the fact that Jesus has also said to us that he has chosen us to be his friends. He says this, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. My mom grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, her father was a, a very successful attorney in Atlanta, and she grew up in this, this house that was modeled after a castle in Austria, way up on a hill. And, and I remember going through my grandparents' house and seeing pictures of my grandmother and grandfather all over the world. I just, you know, Machu Picchu, China, like right after Nixon, that China opened up everywhere. Pictures all over, all over the world. And, and my mother, my grandmother was a, 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 a master in a Japanese art of flower arrangement. And these were busy people. So who raised my mom and her siblings? Well, there was this wonderful African-American woman named Annabelle. And Annabelle was there day after day raising my mom and her siblings. And the sad thing about the story of Annabelle was that when, when I heard my, my, my family talking about Annabelle, they always sort of, they always talked about her as if she was a child. Like the things that she was interested in were kind of cute. And, and, and they sort of used diminutive words for Annabelle. And Annabelle was a grown woman with her own house and her own family. And yet Annabelle was spoken about as if she was less than. And the bathroom that Annabelle used was down in the basement of the house, not in the upper floors. And so here's the thing, for all of the affection that, that this family had for Annabelle, Annabelle was viewed as a servant. But here's the thing, we, as children of God, we, as people who know Jesus, we are invited to serve our God. We are invited to journey alongside our God in God's plan for this world. Jesus does not call us servants or look down on us. No, Jesus says, I have made known to you everything that the Father has told me. I have made known this good news to you that you are a stakeholder. You are a shareholder. You are invited to join me in the work that God has called me to do in this world. I don't call you servants. I call you friends. And then it gets even better than that. Because Jesus says to his disciples then, and, and this is what we know, is that Jesus has chosen us to go and bear fruit that will last. He says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. 
Go and bear fruit that will last. What does that mean, to bear fruit that will last? You know, I, I, I think maybe one way that we could think about fruit that would last is, it is doing something that will let us be remembered for a very long time. I think about Joan and Maury Porter with the Porter Hall that the youth use and the Center for Spiritual, the Porter Center for Spiritual Renewal over there. And they were faithful giving members to the church who helped this building be built. And this is a gift that lasts. And I think about the, the, the Engel Prayer Garden. And I, I was walking with Nancy about two weeks ago in the garden and I said, this is a gift that has lasted. All throughout this pandemic, I was doing memorial services and weddings and I met with countless people outside in this prayer garden. A gift that will last. But here's the thing, I think it means something more than that. You know, when a gift that will last, fruit that will last, whenever we perform an act of mercy, whenever we love someone in a nurturing way, whenever we put ourselves in at the role of a father or a mother of someone who feels abandoned and alone. This is fruit that will last. And, and people might not know about this act, but God knows. And every act of mercy and every act of love and every act of comfort that we offer to another person is not invisible to God. No, it is an act that is growing. It is fruit of the Spirit. It is fruit of God working through us in a way. And here's the thing, this will not perish. It is fruit that will last forever. So, Jesus has chosen us to bear fruit that will last. I want to close our, our time together with, with just a, a thought. This is, this is Mothering Sunday. This is the Sunday where we remember those who have given us nurturing, protective love. So I, I, I want to challenge you to think about, and not in a way that diminishes the mothers who gave birth to us, but think back on your life and the people that God has put in your life who have loved you with a nurturing, grace-filled, protective love. And the next challenge I give you is to think about people who God has put in your life that might be in need of nurturing, grace-filled love. And what might it look like for you to enter into a relationship with that person and fill that vulnerable spot that they have in their lives? So, today, be sure to, if you can, call your mother, but also maybe call someone who has loved you like a mother. And if you can't do either of those things, take some time to thank God for the people God has put in your life to love. Amen.